Welcome, everybody. This is Two Intech Guys Take Questions and Share Cool Stuff. And we are excited to be able to share some cool stuff with you today. I'm particularly excited about a thing that's new to me as of very recently, and we will get to that very soon. Before we get too far into this, I want to draw attention to the picture behind the title on the screen, right? So you look at this, you look at this title, and we've I've been doing this every week, right? I'm getting a picture behind. Uh, the title of somebody, you know, just saying, hey, right, peace sign, yeah? What I would, what I would challenge our, uh, our, our, our joiners, our people who attend, uh, the people who watch the recordings to do, send me a picture of you doing something like this, and, and I will use that picture as a part of, of a future EdTech Guys Take Questions uh, so, so, so send it to me, right? Uh, rh at nextvista.org. We'll get all that in there. All right. Ooh, whoa. whoa. Given thanks. Oh. Got to give thanks. <laughs> Got to give thanks, right? So thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for, uh, for taking time to hang out with, uh, with me and Richard. I hope you find this fun as we see it. If we're not having fun doing this, we're doing it wrong, which I think applies to teaching as well, but that's just me. Also want to say thank you to Free Tech for Teachers, Richard Shindig. Uh, he's been doing this for years, over 15,000 posts for ideas that you can take, and it's a lot more than just a link. There are ideas there. You should be giving that a look. Thank you to all of the good folks in Jerome and Idaho at Falls City Academy at Jerome High School and Summit Elementary. I've been working with you guys over the, uh, over the last eight months or so, and, and it's a pleasure doing so. Uh, also, to Susan Stewart's crew in Fowler Unified, Susan and I do a webinar every Thursday specific time uh, called Activities Across Grade Levels, where we take some idea uh, or some topic or even a subject and say, okay, what might this look like for the, the young learners, K2? What does this look like for upper elementary, three to five? What does this look like for middle school? What does this look like for high school? If you haven't looked at these, give them a look. On our webinars page, you can go and you can catch all of those. We, we've revamped the webinars page and you can find all of the, the back issues, the previously recorded episodes of the activities set as well as the two ed tech guys stuff so we are happy that that's there i want to say a thank you to the Krauss center for innovation merit 20 people Woo! all right and all my all my friends there cass and gay and justin and just the team over there as well so we would like to say hello to you if you are joining us for the first time then then we need to be social and meet you properly i will hand it over uh, it's Richard in a second to do that. Uh, I want to say that I am a former high school teacher. I taught Japanese language. I became a principal of a K-12 and then an online school, and now I run a little nonprofit called Next Vista for Learning. It's a library of videos by and for teachers and students everywhere, all free. I hope you'll give that a look at nextvista.org. So, uh, Richard, actually, give, give like I think I, I, I took out the Richard slide or something. That's and, all right. So I, uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm here. in your direction, right? I, I can just look at it like this, right? So I'm Richard. I run freetechforteachers.com and practicaledtech.com. In my real life, I'm dad of two little girls. I teach high school computer science currently. Prior to that, I spent a whole lot of years on the road helping schools integrate technology into their classrooms in fun and interesting ways. Before that, I taught social studies. And before that, I taught people how to load and unload trucks at FedEx. Very nice, very nice indeed. Uh, when when we look at the 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 different range of experiences that teachers have coming into this, like like today, we have got teachers from all over. We've got uh, we've got an educator in Israel joining us today. We have got uh, Alex in Argentina, Buenos Aires, bienvenidos. Welcome to you, and glad to have you as a part of this as well. And folks from all across the United States, some of whom call gnats black flies, others who call black flies gnats. So so you know part of the discussion we had on the way in to this recording. Now, how this is gonna work today? We share cool stuff and then take questions. So if you are joining us and you have a question of any kind, feel free to toss it into the chat. And also please make sure that you have switched all panelists to all panelists and attendees so the other attendees can see what you have to say as well. We always find that people have cool things to share and that's a good way to go. <laughs> Patricia says, I worked at FedEx too. Wow. All right. So. Richard, start us off with a quick share, okay? A little, little bit of this Library of Congress stuff. All right, so Library of Congress has a great collection of historic images and artifacts called Free to Use and Reuse. And earlier this week, they had a blog post. The Library of Congress blog, by the way, is fun to read if you're 
into history or library science. It's fun to read. Uh, and they, they featured a collection of old maps of cities. And, you know, that's just one of the many, many collections in there. So if you're looking for you know, some old maps or some old posters or some old WPA posters in there, there's lots of cool stuff that you can download for free and reuse. One of the things I think is cool about these old map images is you can download them and then put them into Google Earth and layer them on top of a current view of the world, nice. which makes it a really cool way to compare how cities have changed or how coastlines have changed. But if you don't know how to do that in Google Earth, you could also layer the images using just Google Slides or PowerPoint by messing around with the transparency of the two images. Mm, very nice. Fun very stuff. nice indeed. All right. So loads of good stuff there. And, and by the way, you can spend all weekend on the Library of Congress site, right? Yeah. Nothing, nothing but good stuff happening there. My share this week is a tool that, that is, was unknown to me very recently, but, I, but in, a, in a group that I'm a part of, I saw a mention of this, NaraView, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. Uh, and we can find out because, uh, as you see in the slide, NaraView by Guy Bressler. Guy actually is our educator from Israel joining us today. And I just shot him a note and just said, hey, I think I'm going to share NaraView today. He's like, all right. All right so, so joining in, very cool. Now, here's the thing, right? I was talking yesterday, right? Yesterday with, uh, with one of my Merit 20 teachers. And, uh, and she was saying, oh, you know, it's so hard to get my fifth graders to embrace researching anything. You know, so, so teaching research skills is, is a thing, right? You know, like kids are like, well, I'm on the computer and now I'm on a game. Um, and how do you teach them? How do you teach them research skills? Well, in terms of embracing the idea, I said, hey, wait a minute. I just learned about this tool. I want to show it to you. And we got all excited about talking about the possibilities with this. So, so what this is, right? NaraView, you, you pick two different Wikipedia articles, all right? And I think as most educators know, Wikipedia is a pretty darn good place to start your research, not necessarily a great place to finish it, but, but a different discussion, that. Nevertheless, there's loads of interesting things going on with, with Wikipedia. So you, you have these two different things. And in this case, uh, which, which is taken from the tutorial that Guy made, uh, he has Langston Hughes and Kendrick Lamar. Like that, you're, you're trying to go from one to the other and you do it via clicks in Wikipedia. So, so you're, you're, you're reading a page about one particular topic, person, whatever it might be, and, and you pick one and go to that next page and your idea, your goal, right, because it's a game, is to make your way to the goal piece, right? So, so in this case, Kendrick Lamar. So, so at, in doing this, you, you might end up with lots and lots of different, you know, pieces along the way. You might be able to do it very quickly and kind of, you know, very few degrees. You remember the Kevin Bacon game, you know, things like this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it is a promising little, little, little option for those who are like, I'm going to try to get kids to read a little bit more closely uh, in, in the space where they're researching things to really begin to think, well, you know, there are these different links. What, what do they apply to? What, what are the relationships between, uh, between, you know, these particular items and this particular topic? I love seeing kids begin to, to talk about connections. To me, that's like the next level up in terms of, of cool and fun learning. So narrowview.com. If you got questions specifically about it, toss it in the chat because Guy might be able to answer them for you. There you go. Uh, and then after the recording, we'll, let, let's actually get, you know, now, Guy, if you are still on after the recording, we'll, we'll like uh, activate your, your microphone. You, you can talk and, and all of us will talk. I think that'd be good fun. All right. So every week uh, when, when Richard and I share our resources, we actually move those things to a page called Two Guys Resources. And I will update that today before I send out the email to everybody who registered so that you know how to get back to these slides, those links, uh, the resources, and of course, the recording that we are doing at the moment. All right, so it is time to jump into some questions. And Richard, why don't you get us going on that front with questions that have come in over the last week or so? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'm getting lost. In, I got net lost in there of you. That was brand new to me, too. So I just got kind of lost in there. Uh, all right. So. Let's start with the tough one, Rushton. What do you say? Let's do it. Bring on the tough right. one. So I'm writing to learn more about how schools in general handle student privacy and data sharing. Every time I see a great website or app and include it in a lesson plan, I eventually realize it's not advised to use because of privacy or data mining. And then I need to scrap the hours put into the lesson plan and start over. For example, Vokaroo, that I mentioned, in 
an email was about, I was about to share with our staff, then went on this website, student privacy website, and noticed it's not approved for our schools. Uh, I'm at a loss with many apps and websites. How do schools handle this? Thank you, Betsy. So, a couple of things uh, to point out here with this question. It's, it's, a, it's a doozy of a question, I think. Can I can I sh screen share? Let me let me screen share. Absolutely. Matter of fact, I, I moved away from the question mark slide, thinking we, we we should we should get a little more active in this this part of the yeah yeah. yeah. Of the show. So, uh, the the registry that was mentioned in the email was this one here, which is uh, SPDC, which is kind of a special interest group, um, and the re their database is very very limited. And the person who was writing to me. Um, was using just this database to make all their decisions about, about data privacy and whether or not they should use use tool or not, which is, I guess, okay. It's a place My to concern, start. Yeah, I, it's a start. My concern is that it's a very, as I looked through it, it's a very limited database. And so the recommendations are based on a very small sample size of you know, a handful of schools, a few dozen schools, not this huge, not a huge database. And so for that reason, I, my advice would be, look at your district's policy, right? And you know, a lot of teachers don't even realize that there is a district policy about data. Hopefully your district does have one, but look at what that says and then make the decision for yourself. For example, in the, this site here, this, this database here, all these say they're, they're not approved for Vocaroo, but if you look at Vocaroo and you look at their terms of service, I know in my district, it's totally okay. And it's totally okay in hundreds of other districts that I've used it in. So you kind of have to look at your district's policy and not necessarily you know, some database that you find online. All that said, Common Sense Media does a nice job of putting some reasonable uh, parameters around it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but again, you gotta check with your school's policy because yeah, some of them are really strict and others are, you know, not so strict at all. Richard, if you would scroll down a little bit on the page that you've got on the screen at the moment, because I, I want to point yeah. out something that uh, that is pretty common. It, it seems to me, uh, it, it's not completely clear to me that the the material that is in the comments area. So if you look in that, go back up towards the top, right? You've got yeah. these different, uh, different columns there and agreement type. The very first one uh, says, you know, vocal respects right up to a point. Then you see the same, pretty much the same comment multiple times. Now that's either because that's the way the site works for checking these things out, or it's because a lot of these districts are using what they find on other district sites, right? right. And, and you don't know if the district that kind of launched this is a district that, that did this check thoroughly. You don't know if the district that launched this did this a year ago and it doesn't apply anymore. Because just like the discussions we've had about Zoom, right, what, what the issues with the, the, the real issues that were there for Zoom, uh, you know, two months ago, just don't apply right now. They, they made some major changes in that they went from being this, uh, this kind of uh, video chat platform that, that, that a few people know about it to, to the entire world using it, right? Uh, and, and kudos to them for making the changes because there were changes that quite probably needed to be made, right? Fair enough. Um, but but making those changes means that you're learning something about your uh, about your clientele. Uh, you're saying, oh my God, all of these school districts using we we, you know, if if we're not going to be you know suffering from a bunch of bad PR, we need to make these changes, or maybe they just want to make the changes. Period. So in Zoom's case, for example, you know they were one of the first out of the box to say, you know, we'll make our premium uh, features for, or some of them free to schools in a particular space. And in this case, China, because this was like back in January, they they jumped on on that that wagon early. Uh, so, so that is not to say that there aren't sites that have issues for sure. So, so do, do, do your research, but check is the, is the set of, of pieces of information that have been gathered for me up to date? That's one of the biggest questions. And, and then also, does it look like everybody else's? If so, you might be doing something <laughs> along that line. Uh, and Amy says this, this doesn't, uh, this website doesn't list my state, Connecticut. Is it a, a database that recommends products? Another good question, right, is that for any given thing you find, is it actually more about how 
um, about how it works or, or, or arrangements it might have. There's a lot of questions out there. So we all have to be putting our, our serious critical thinking uh, caps on as we do that. So Richard, shall we, shall we go to the next one or anything else? Let's go to, let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, they, and I'll just, uh, was it Karen that just mentioned that they didn't show Connecticut on there? Amy, yeah, they, Amy mentioned. Amy did, sorry. Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of, uh, this, but I, I don't want to pick on this. I don't want to pick on this database any longer. But just in general, you know, look at the the size and the breadth of the database and, and how big a, a sample size is. I mean, there are there are no references to Maine in here, for example. Mm. Uh, so, you know, as always, you know, be careful with what you read on the internet, as Mark Twain said in 1892. So, <laughs> all right, you can, uh, you, can, you can stop sharing, by the way, if you want. Okay, you okay. Have. There we go. Let's stop. There we go. We're back to that. Okay. So question, uh, question number two yes. came from Karen. We had two, two different Karens who asked questions. Uh, I need to make a tutorial about Google Meet, but when I try to screencast a video call, the camera in the video call says camera unavailable because it's busy recording the screencast. How do I get around this? Uh, yeah, so this is a very meta problem, right? Uh, and it, here's, a, here's the solution. Depends on the screen recording software that you're using. So if you're using something like um, Screencastify perhaps, or uh, one of the other browser-based screen recorders, it will try to use the same resources for both the screencast and for the Google Meet screencast, if that makes sense, right? right. And they can't do both of those at the same time. Both happening out of the browser, essentially. Right. You can't, you can't have those because they're, they're conflicting. So the workaround for this is to make sure you disable the, the webcam in the screen recorder before you launch your Google Meet. That said, there's an even easier way to do this. If you are on a Windows 10 or on a Mac computer, you could use desktop recording software like Screencast-O-Matic, or even on a Mac, you could even use just QuickTime, and you can record your entire desktop instead of just the web browser, and then you'll be able to capture everything at the same time. In fact, that's how I did it. When I did my screencast on how to do a Google Meet, I used Screencast-O-Matic's desktop software to capture everything, including my browser. Nicely done. I will add to the chat a link to uh, to Eric Kurtz's resources about Google Meet. So he did a number of screencast uh, tutorials uh, about Google Meet, which which is to say two things. First of all, it's certainly possible. I mean, he did it, as did say Richard, <laughs> using screencast o -matic. But second, in 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 thinking this, this is a lot of teachers are in this space. Like, oh, I need to make a tutorial telling kids how to do this. Maybe. Or maybe somebody else has already done it, right? And if so, then then don't reinvent the wheel, right? Check out uh, check out Eric's Eric's like this amazing. He's done so much good stuff over at ControlAltAchieve.com. Hope you'll give that a look. So follow that link uh, after our episode and and find out like uh, the different things that he's put there. Cool, Richard. Let's keep going. I, I'll piggyback on that one mm. real quick. Just say. There is a slight benefit to doing your own screencast if you can do it without a whole lot of effort, and that is sometimes people like to hear a familiar voice. In it. Uh, well said. Right? Uh, I've been doing this for my own staff that I work with. Even though I've already made the video for the whole world in the past, I'll say something like, hey, Ron, or hey, yeah. Paul, here's how to do X, Y, Z. Right? Just you know, a little, little familiarity. And, and kids like to shout out when, you, when you're putting their names in. Yeah. All right, so next one up came from Karen in Cornish, who's here live with us right now. Thanks, Karen. Karen, you rock. I have a question for you about Google Slides. I'm interested in using slides to create choice boards and memory games for Feel Good Friday with elementary students. I've learned from other teachers how to use their templates or create my own. The problem comes when I embed the choice board on a page on our website, the Slides Banner, it appears at the bottom of the slide that allows one to advance to the next slide covers some of the board. Can that be hidden or minimized? I don't want kids to advance to the next slide as the other slides are hyperlinked to the choices. Uh, I've heard about publishing the slides and downloading them as PDF. I just want to be interactive for links to work once it's embedded. Uh, can you point me in the right direction? So, we've got a couple of ideas. 
can't really make that banner go away, unfortunately. Uh, when you hover over it, when you, when your kid hovers his or her mouse over the bottom of the slide, it, it pops up no matter what you do. Tried, believe me, I've tried. I wish I could make it go away, can't. Um, that said, when I've done something similar to this, I've, I've uh, similar in that I use the linking of slides to do a, a Jeopardy board. I just am really careful to say like, don't click any, don't don't click anything but the slide itself. You know, I, I do that. The other piece, if you want to go in a different, slightly different direction, thinglink.com. Uh, there's an education version that's available. Thinglink.com is really good for putting up a collage or you know putting up a picture and including links to audio and video in there, provided the audio and video is hosted online somewhere. So you can have your YouTube video play when you click on the little marker that's in the image, or you can have the audio from SoundCloud play when you click on the marker that's in the image. So that just gave me a good idea for a video to make this afternoon. So maybe I'll and, do that. And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on this uh, on on this answer from a slightly different uh, point of view. And so so let's let's go back. We want to share share the slides again. I want I want to show you something that that we're doing as a part of this. So so as you see, I, I am I am doing something that a lot of presenters would not, which is instead of of going to slides and clicking present and sharing the screen that way, I'm actually presenting from within a browser window, and that's often because I want to switch over to something else. And in this case, I'm switching over to the slides that we're using today, Meta, right? So here's how this works for me. If, if what you want is in, in that particular page, a, an image that links to your slides, you can grab, say, your first slide, go to File, Download, and JPEG, and you can grab a, a, a JPEG, just an image that is that slide, put that in, make the image a link to your slides, and work it that way. And you might say, yeah, but then they're going into the slides and it's editing and it's not quite what I want. Well, over here, here is, here is the, the set of slides we're using at the moment. I, want you, I don't know if you can see this on your screen, but at the end of a, of a set of, at the end of a URL for slides, uh, it'll say typically uh, edit, blah, 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 blah. If you remove all that and you change it to present, then you have a link that will take you to the first slide in your slides. So then, then if you give that to somebody and you've made the slide deck viewable by anyone with the link, then they'll be able to go through your slides even if they don't have a Google account and you haven't shared it with them because it, it's viewable by anyone with the link and you're sending them directly there. So, I mean, it's all, there's always kind of a matter of choice in, in these things. And, and I think in your question, there's a little bit about, I, I, didn't wanna, I didn't want them to have to leave the other place, but I, th I think that's gonna be a part of it if you're gonna make a really interactive piece. So nice question, nice question. Yeah. Uh, all right, so let's get the next question in there. Uh, well, actually the question just popped into the chat. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, Rushton, a little Q and A on uh, this Q&A panel separate from the chat panel. Hmm. Is there a good free site you can recommend that can convert a PDF to a Google Doc? Yes, it's called Google Docs. Uh, <laughs> so if you, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, you can upload a PDF into your Google Drive hmm. and then it will turn into, or you can turn it from there into an editable Google Doc. I'll show you real quick how to do this because it is a pretty, do I have time to do it, Russian? I think so. All right, cool. It's really easy to do. So let me uh, do my screen share. There it is. Right. So here's my Google Drive. Everyone should be able to see it. I've got all kinds of stuff in there. If it's not very well organized, do not ask me for organization tips. <laughs> so I've got this PDF I'm going to upload. Right, my Arduino project design that my students were working on. Right? You'll see there's the PDF, right? When I click on it, it's showing the PDF, but I can now go open with Google Docs and in a moment, there it is. 
Google Docs format. Quick, easy, no shady third-party sites required. <laughs> shady third-party. <laughs> you've, you've covered some third-party sites over time. Some of them have been shady, I take it. Yeah, I have. I have. I, I, I am very, very much versed in uh, staying away from shady sites. We, we, we learn as we go. So, so I'm, I'm all hot and bothered to handle this, this question about screen time. Read that for us. Yeah. You, let's get, let's, what kind of rules related to screen time should I be thinking about with students right now? So, so here's the thing, guys. And, and last weekend, I did, a, I did a webinar, advice for parents of elementary school students, and, and hit this particular topic pretty hard. Uh, now, and, and, and let, me, let me summarize this for you as we're, we're getting close to the end of our half hour, right? But, but essentially, when people say, how much time? How much time should it be each day? No more than how many hours? This is one of those many way too simplistic questions that, that educators get all the time, right? Give me a quick, give me a single answer, a simple answer. It's like, but there's so many variables involved. So, so the American Academy of Pediatrics talks about a difference between, uh, between recreational screen time and positive screen time. And let's look at that for a minute, right? Because uh, you know, you'll see things out there where people say, you know, you know developing children should only have 90 minutes of, and there's brain research and, and, and yes, and, and you know, it's hard to know, right? Because there's loads of different things that researchers have said. However, we are factoring a lot of things into our world right now. So if you've got kids at home and you're trying to teach and you're also trying to help them with their second grade homework or whatever it might be, you know that, that you're, you're balancing things as best you can and it's exhausting and man, big hug to you because I, I, I get it. Uh, not that I have kids. Cats. It's better. Anyway, so, so in dealing with this, all right, think along these lines. If screen time is, say, just playing a video game, that's recreational screen time. You know, if you, are, if you guys are just watching a rerun on TV, that's recreational screen time. But it could be that the game is helping a kid begin to develop a, you know, a, a set of thoughts about how to, how, you know, grit related to solving problems. So, so there, there are potential positives in there. With, with a rerun, you guys as a family might be discussing it in ways that it's incredibly educational and helpful in, in developing how you talk about different things as a family. Now, what, what do they identify as positive screen time? Well, a lot of educational things are positive. So, so you know, you go and you spend time, you know, at Narrowview or at the, the Library of Congress site, and, you know, this, this is positive screen time. Now, if the questions surrounding how you use those sites are not interesting enough, then that's just time in front of a screen. But on the other hand, you know, if you're really developing some good questions about these things, that's educational and that's, that's time to, that's worth it, right? Other, other examples of positive screen time might be something like, uh, a, you know, an interesting movie that you watch together as a family and talk about, or even a chat with, with, uh, with, with Aunt B in North Carolina, old school reference, right? And, and so things like that can, can be very positive. So, so when you think about how to limit screen time, Go, go easy on, 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 on that particular item because it, sometimes people just take it way too far. Well, no more than an hour and 52 minutes. Really? All right. So, so grain of salt. Richard. Uh, I think <laughs> you covered it. Uh, I've, so, I, so I, you know, I have two little girls who are three and two mm -hmm. and Screen time is a, is a thing we discuss all the time, not me and the kids, but you know, me and my partner, we discuss you know, how, much, how much screen time do we, do we watch and you know, that, that sort of thing. And you know, there, sometimes it is a babysitter, right? Like, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, stigma Think, things around. Things to factor in and, and things that people say, right? Right, there, there's a lot of stigma around this and you know, we're kind of in a parenting, informal parenting group with other parents, and we talk about these things. Like, yep, you know, sometimes you need the 20 minutes of Cl Clifford the Big Red Dog so that you can get dinner made, and that's okay. And you don't necessarily need to feel bad about that. Uh, then we do have the the times where we're watching it together, and we watch this show called The Animal Show, and it's really just animals. Uh, on, on the screen and we talk about the animals, right? And so that's a little bit of an educational screen time like you were mentioning. So. Heck yeah. 
So, yeah. so as, as, we, as we wind down the recording for today, you know, let, let's just kind of come back to the issue of you know, balance and everything, right? If, if what happens is you're really zeroed in on exactly how many minutes of screen time is going on, you know, that's, that's probably not the question. The question is, are there breaks? Are there breaks that happen regularly during the day? Are you guys talking about these things in interesting ways? Are you developing how you talk about what all of you experience in order to grow together as a family? Those are the bigger questions. So again, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, you know, we want to get some people giving us some pictures, uh, peace signs, make sure you're doing it this way and not like from the back of the hand because that would be insulting to all our British friends. Don't want to do that. <laughs> All right, but, but we would love to get some pictures. Uh, send, send it to us. You, we've got all kinds of stuff out there to, to help you find us. Um, a reminder that as we do these different things as educators, our goal is to take care of these kids and their learning. And by doing, uh, and, and in order to do that well, we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. So, so you know, take those moments where we just go for a walk. Take the, you know, get a little exercise in. You need a nap? Take a nap. You know, whatever it takes, but make sure you're ready so that when that kid desperately needs a, a creative insight, you're good to go. I hope you'll sign up for my nextvista.org newsletter. I send it out once a month with all kinds of goodies in it. I have uh, a number of different writing things that go on, a blog called Inspiring Improvement, a book about how to get better as a teacher, a book about how to work with your colleagues to make your school a more personally and professionally satisfying place for everybody, and a new book from NCEA on how leaders can use tech to make their schools all the more interesting and engaging for everyone concerned. Richard. So I have a couple of things to share. Number one, the Practical Ed Tech newsletter comes out on Sunday evenings or Monday mornings, depending on your time zone. And if you sign up, you'll get a copy of the Practical Ed Tech handbook for free, 55 pages of my favorite things. And if you're looking for some summer PD, I'm hosting the Practical Ed Tech virtual summer camp three times this summer. The June session has become very popular this week. 35 people are signed up to join me in June. Very cool. I hope you will be one of them as well. And if you need some quick tips, like how to convert your PDF into a Google Doc, check out my YouTube channel where I have a whole bunch of stuff like that. Guys, we are happy that you join us. Uh, it is very much the case that, that getting together and sharing cool ideas, especially on a Friday, you know, one of the questions was about fun Fridays as we see it. Uh, sharing cool ideas that you might want to like incorporate into your, your creative uh, brainstorming time over, over your weekend as you think ahead of next week and how, how do I get to that next kid, right? Stuff like that is, is the kind of thing that is all the more exciting when, when you have fun things to, to share with others. So we hope that you will join us each week. Uh, we hope you will stay in touch. We hope you will send us questions. We hope you will send us a picture with a peace sign going on there. Uh, and that that's part of how we can do this. If you are joining us live, we're about to like have a little bit more of a discussion. Uh, if you have joined us in the recording, thank you very much, and we will see you next week.